After a lifetime of researching the dynamic and enigmatic world of light entertainment, I've decided to ditch my notebook and meet the people who inspire me. What makes them the people they are? How do they feel about the show business landscape in which they find themselves? And in a world where anyone can be a star, is there still a need for performers who have universal appeal? Come with me on a journey of discovery as I get a unique insight into Britain's favourite stars with a little help from my glamorous assistants. Yeah, well, I say glamorous, more like hazardous. And of course, we'll have a bit of fun along the way. Legendary writer, actor and director George Layton became a household name when he was cast as Bombardier Solly Solomons in Perry and Croft's second military-based sitcom. It ain't half hot, mum, alongside Windsor Davis, Melvin Hayes and Michael Bates. Not content with one successful sitcom, George secured a starring role in ITV's Doctor in the House, written by some of the cream of British comedy. In later years, George embraced the breadth of TV drama and secured roles in BBC dramas including EastEnders and Doctors. I caught up with the star of stage and screen to talk sitcom, soap and recollection on a glittering career. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr George Layton. Right, so um, let's start at the beginning. Yes. Like so many of your peers, you attended the legendary RADA, where you were awarded the Emil Littler Award for Most Promising Actor. Well, better say what RADA is, those that well, may yeah. not know. Yeah, the, OK. The Royal Academy of Dramatic Art. It was my dad used to say, the Royal Academy of Fanatic Tarts. <laughs> but they are. But they're, yes, I went to RADA. Uh, I did. Yeah, it was 1960. What, what impact do you think that had on your early career? Uh, what impact? Well, I think it was very important. I was a very young 18-year-old. I came to London when I was 18 to go to drama school, to Dorada. And I think in today's terms, that was, it was like a 14-year-old, really. I was very naive. Uh, quite streetwise, I could look after myself. I don't mean physically, I just had an antenna eyes to anything sort of dubious. But uh, I was very young to go straight from home into digs and look after myself. But... And I think had I gone straight into the profession as an actor, um, I don't know what would have happened, but I think for two years it was very good to be on the fringe of the profession, to learn things about the profession and being an actor. And having a, it was a two-year course then. It's, I, think, I believe it's three years now. <clears throat> but uh, it was, a good, I think, a good entry into becoming a full-time actor at the age of 20, which, mm. which is uh, what happened. So... And rather, it was, it was very good for me. Uh, I didn't like everything there. I wasn't one or two of the teachers. I wasn't quite sure. You know, I don't know. I thought they were. I thought they were. I don't know. How can I put it? Just uh, only a couple of them. I thought uh, they were sort of big fish in a small pond, and they were using. You know, I wasn't. In, I wasn't in all of them as much as some of the other students were, and that's what I mean. I was a bit more streetwise, possibly. Yeah. Uh, some of them, oh, some were great. I mean, there was a. I loved doing restoration. For instance, I did Lord Foppington in the relapse, and that was outrageous. I mean, way over the top. Uh, but the um, the director was a very camp director. I love a lovely man called uh, what is called Edmund Gray, but he was Teddy Gray. He was the expert in restoration of the style playing Lord Forpington. Uh, I'd love to do it again. I'm well, probably too old now, but I would have loved to have done it again. Uh, I did that at drama school. Uh, I did um, Oh, Mr. Pinchwife in The Country Wife. That was one of the end of sort of course plays that got me a good agent and a good job. So, it, yes, it, it was very good for me. And I, I did like John Farnwald, the principal. I, I thought he was a very honourable and nice man. I liked him a lot. So in the main, yes, it, it was terrific for me, really. And... Uh, did quite well. I won a couple of prizes, which, um, well, together, the Emmy Litter Award was worth £25, and the Dennis Blakelock Award, Dennis Blakelock was a very famous radio actor, and he gave a, I think it was £5 I got for an outstanding performance in a minor role, so I got this prize of 30 quid, which I uh, invested in jumping the queue to get a telephone. You wouldn't believe how hard in those days, 1960, to get a telephone was, you had to be in a, a waiting list and could, could last for years. But I managed to swing it and get a phone. The only sad thing is, while I was at the phone exchange arguing my case, an actor needs a phone, uh, I lost the first job. Uh, I couldn't get, nobody knew where I was and couldn't get hold of me. But then uh, this phone did actually 
helping out a lot of jobs. Um, I got the Belgrave Theatre Coventry, great repertory company at the time. I shared a flat with two other actors in Islington, and well, even the, the, the landlady, they were from a family of taxi drivers, and she was thrilled to have a phone in the house. It was North 6264, I never forget, North is Islington. In those days, it was all lovely names like Gladstone and uh, Latimer, and this was North 6264, and Rada was 6264 Gower Street. I was always looking for signs. You know, this is a good sign. He's a, he's a lot of work. And I came home one time. I was showing with an actor called John Go Lightly and John Low. And there's just a note taken by the landlady. It said, Ken Loach, three p. Oh, this is about 1964, I think. By the way, uh, um, three p.m. Ken Loach, BBC TV Centre, Shepherd's Bush, eight thousand. I didn't know, was it for me? Was it for any of the other two actors? Anyway, I was first home, so I rang. Got us, rang BBC TV Centre, got through to Ken Loach. And he was obviously looking me up in Spotlight. And he actually cast, he said, yeah, come and see me tomorrow. And he cast me in Z Cars, which was a big series of that, a huge series. So um, then I found out actually it was the, one of the other Johns, John Lowe, who it was first for, but I got the part but nice thing about the stories he also got a part in the same episode so I didn't feel too bad but that was, that's the kind of luck I've had I'm very very lucky yeah I've jumped ahead a bit there yeah so did, do you think um, rather did you some favours in terms of like the CV and stuff like that definitely oh definitely it did have a cachet I mean I never considered going anywhere else I don't I, uh, I used to go to Lambda and do these exams and you got so, you know as an amateur you got bronze and silver medals and certificates but I never, I never considered I would, would go anywhere but Rada because I thought it was the best. That's how I felt. Probably wasn't. Central School of Speech and Drama is very good as well. But that's where I wanted to go and that's where I went. And I think, yes, I think it stood me in good stead. Well, it did. My first job was at the Belgrade Coventry, which was one of the best repertory companies in the country. And um, they were one of the first reps to copy the... Uh, copy the... Um, well, it was Shakespeare Memorial Theatre then, but the Royal Shakespeare model of doing plays in repertoire. So in a season, you didn't, like most reps, do a play for two weeks or three weeks, depending on how big the rep was and how big their audience was. You did it, and then it went out of the repertoire, and then you do another play, and then you came back to it, and it was fantastic. I did Twelfth Night, Caucasian Chalk Circle, and um, I was able to then try different things and go back to a part, which was very, very good for me. It's terrific. I think I did about, I think I did September and I left in about the following March. So I was only there about six months. That was marvellous. And I think I went back there. I went back there again as well. It's hard to remember my whole career now. Uh, but it was, it was fabulous. And then that went on and opened some doors for you in television as well? Well, television came quite a lot later. I, I went from the Belgrade Theatre doing these lovely parts. I did Festi in Twelfth Night. There was a, a program in those days where ABC Television sponsored trainee directors, and the trainee director at the Belgrade was Trevor Nunn. So I did Festi in Twelfth Night, and he played Fabian. Um, lots of lovely parts. He did a wonderful production of a play called The Keep by Gwyn Thomas. I enjoyed that very much. And then I got into the Broadway production of Chips with Everything by Arnold Wesker. Now, fantastic break for me to go to Broadway at the age of 21, I think I was just 21, and be on Broadway in this play with the, about, the play as you know it is about the REF, but it actually represents the establishment in England, and uh, how many were there? A load of squaddies, a whole group of, about 20 of us went out to America. Um, I loved it, it was a fantastic experience, so that was my second job. Then came back and straight into the Nottingham Playhouse with Frank Dunlop. Um, did a play called uh, Sir Thomas More, first time for 400 years, and I think it's been done again, but Ian McKellen played Sir Thomas More and I played the clown. So I had a really good run, and then I did get into TV. I auditioned for a new programme called The Likely Lads, which went on to be television history, but I auditioned for one of the leads, the part that eventually James Bolin was cast in, part of Terry Collier. And the writers rightly said, well, um, Ian Lafrenet and Dick Clement um, said, look, you know, we like you, but we can't risk you 
playing the lead in a TV series like this, you know, with yeah. such a little, I, I do, I've done a little bit of telly, that's all one small part or something. And, but we'll write your part in it. And they did. They wrote me this part of Mario the hairdresser. And I did a few black lads, and that was good. And I didn't think they would do it, but they did. It was lovely. Uh, and then, in about 1965, I got into a twice weekly soap opera called Swizzlewick. And that gave me a lot of good running television, nine months of. So I could then turn around and say, yes, I've got experience. And that, that did help. So I was never really out of work. I think when my first son was born, and he's now over 50, I think I had a spell just before he was born. And I just bought a house, my first house, and the mortgage was £32 a month. And I used to think, oh, Lord, how am I going to pay this every month, £32? I mean, it's hard to believe now, isn't it? And I got offered Doctor Who, a whole series. No interview, anything, just an offer. And it, oh, it saved my bacon at that time. It was fantastic. So uh, it was in the Patrick Troughton era of Doctor Who. So I got into that, six episodes, and Touchwood was done quite well since then. Yeah. And then got into Doctor Who, of course. Yeah. I did quite a few tellies. Yeah, so in that sort of period where you rose to fame, that was when television executives were realising the power of television a little bit more, um, and that medium sort of came of age. In what ways did that benefit? I think, well, I think television had always, um, what is it? Well, I suppose it, it became more popular. Yeah, because new channels, BBC Two opened, didn't it? Still only a few channels. Um, yeah, sorry, I interrupted you. That's fine. I was just wondering how you thought that benefited you as an actor, but other actors of your... Oh, definitely. I mean, um, well, funnily enough, you know, in those days, if you went into a soap opera, like I was in Swizzlewick, and then a year later I went back to do another soap opera called United, about a football club, and that was very trendy then, 1966, you know, World Cup time. 65, 66, I did it. Um, same studio, Swizzlewick. Yeah, so Swizzlewick was 64, and then I went, yeah, that's right, and I went back in 65, and did about another nine months. But in those days, one got terribly terrified of getting typecast, and you wouldn't get any other work. And I thought, well, I'll go in it for nine months, earn enough to get a deposit for a house. That's exactly what I did, and I left, really. I think now people don't worry about getting typecast at all. In fact, quite the opposite. If you're a type, you tend to work, you know, more and more, because, oh, that's what we want, that particular type. And... Um, no, I don't. I don't think worry, people worry about being a long time in a TV show anymore. But I've always left. I, I mean, I, I left Swizzlewick. I left. Um, which I think they wrote me out of Swizzlewick. I can't remember now. Um, I left United. I didn't want to do any more. Did nine months. Uh, I left Doctor in the House. Uh, I left it eight and a half. Mum, um, you know, I was always worried about getting. I don't think it was a bad thing to do because I had a very varied career, you know, and. Uh, yeah, I didn't get typecast anyway. That was the main thing. Yeah. So, 1969, then you secured the part of boisterous medical student Paul Collier in Doctor. I House. did. I did. There's a story there, by the way. Go on. Well, my good friend Christopher Timothy, who we were on Broadway together, and we did other jobs together. He gave me the tip off. He rang me one day and said, "Look, George, they're doing Doctor in the House. You remember the film with Dirt Burger? They're doing a TV version." You ought to go up for it. I'm going up for it. He was very generous to do that, wasn't he? And uh, I, in those days, I was so bold. I rang the casting director myself. I don't know why I did that. But, and I remember her words. She said, um, oh, George, oh, yes, I know your work. Yes, yes. Well, we're just casting the students at the moment. And when we come to the older parts, I'll, I'll bear you in mind. Oh, that put me down a bit. I'm not that old. But I was old. I was, I've always looked younger than my years, but I was older than most. Of, I was about 27 by that time. So... All the actors were seen like in the 20s, early 20s. Anyway, I don't know how it happened, but I did get an interview. It was a, I remember very clearly, it was the la, I was the last person they saw, and I believe they cast Paul Collier. He wasn't actually called Paul Collier. I remember the interview, he was called, the audition, he was called Paul Garston. I prefer the name Paul Collier. And there was not very much to go on. It was just sort of a certain reaction they were looking for. Anyway, long story short, I auditioned. The last person they saw... And they changed their minds and I got the part. And that was a big, big break for me. Huge break. First of all, I knew my strengths lay in comedy. I was pretty good at comedy and good timing. 
and um, it was hard to get the parts to show that. So, and it wasn't a huge part for the first two series, really. It, it just gradually built. I wasn't bothered about being typecast there. I was in it quite a long time. Well, I was in it from uh, 1969 to 1973. And by that time, I was on the writing team. So that was, a, again, a huge break for me. So I left Doctor in the House, I think on the Friday, or Doctor was or Doctor in Charge then. And I started, it ain't half hot, Mum, at the BBC for Croft and Perry on the Monday. So I went from one series to the other. Uh, but I still continued to write Doctor in the House. Mm. And obviously writing something which you're starring in, did you find that difficult? Mm, I did. It was a bit of a strain, actually. Um, I think that's where I, I eventually left <laughs> I think, you know, when I was offered a half and a half it wasn't a huge decision for me because, yeah, you know, yeah, when I was writing it, I couldn't always write myself for the best part. That would be not fair either. In fact, there was one episode where it required one member of cast to have one line at the beginning of an episode and one line at the end. And, of course, I had to do that because I couldn't do it to any of the others. It wouldn't have been fair if I was writing it, even when I was writing with Jonathan Lynn. So, um, but I did write some good parts of myself. I had some great scenes uh, but, yeah, so um, I think people today, when you see people like Ricky Gervais and uh, I can't think of who else writes for, oh, yeah, um, the, the, the Fleabag Lady, you know, um, Phoebe Waller-Bridge. I mean, I think they're fantastic to be in it. But the things have changed, you know. We, we, when I wrote Don't Wet Up, I wanted to be in it. I wanted to write, not the lead. I didn't want the Nigel Havers part, but I wanted the other part, the junior partner, which was based on Paul Collier, really. He was slightly immoral. I would have been perfect in it, but they wouldn't let me, you know. I wasn't bold enough to say, well, you know, I'm, I'm not playing it, I won't let you have it, because I wanted to sell the series. But it is a strain, I think, being in it, because you're watching all sorts of things. I think, I think it's easy enough for people, because it's more accepted, but in those days, you were, you were pigeonholed. You, were, well, you can't be in it, you're the writer. Well, you can't write it, you're the actor. You know. So the producer, Alfred Barkley, took a good risk with me being in the show and writing it. But I did write under a pseudonym for probably a couple of days, I think, but no, a few weeks. I wrote under the name Oliver Fry. And um, you see it in lots of credits, I wrote the name Oliver Fry. Uh, but it was very hard to keep a secret. And also my own nature wouldn't allow me to. I was always interfering. And people thought, well, what has it got to do with you? You know, you know, not as if you wrote it. And of course, I had written it, but I couldn't say. Yeah. So it was a bit frustrating. You talked a little bit there about Don't Wait Up. Um, what's the hardest part about writing with an actor's brain? Did you find that an advantage? No, a huge advantage. Huge, because I, when I'm writing, I do act it out. I act it out. It's like, it's like a, a music. It's like a, really, it's like a musical score. And, you know, I, I hear the line as it should be delivered. And Nigel Havers, God bless him, he, he always got what I was about. He, he always used to deliver the lines exactly as I, I, I wanted it to be. It can't be said for every actor. And it's frustrating if you have an actor, particularly a guest actor, who's not in it, you don't, you know, but... You've got a vision and, listen, I'm not so megalomaniac. I don't want an actor to bring something to it and makes it even better. But when they're not delivering the line in the way that I know is not as funny, it, it was very frustrating. And my, I'm not the most pragmatic person in the world, so I did find it very frustrating. And I had to, you know, sometimes accept things and you, you horse trade and even, even the way I had a great director, Harold Snow, directed beautifully. We worked very closely together. It was like, we're, you know, he, he, we work very well together. But I have done other shows where the director's done it. I think, how, how could you do that? I used to think, oh, yeah, other shows I've written. How could the director not, I, you know, because I write it so, what I think is so clear, too many stage directions, which can be irritated to actors if you put too many stage directions in. But I wanted to paint the picture so clearly they couldn't make any mistakes, especially if they're filming. Yeah. Once in the studio, I can at least come in and say, look, didn't quite see it that way. But when it's on film, when you've done the pre-filming for the sh studio shows, you can't change anything then. And then you think, oh, no, that's not what I had in mind at all. I did find that frustrating. Yeah. But I've pretty well given up writing that, and I don't miss it at all, because I did find it very stressful. Mm. Writing it was stressful, but it was very enjoyable when you got the script done. But then you hand it over, and then you, you, you've got this vision. The only answer for me would have been to direct it myself, and somehow that never seemed to happen. No. And I wish it had, actually. Hmm. Sounds big-headed, doesn't it, when I do. Um, so, 
1974, you were cast as Bombardier Sonny Solomons. Was it 73 or 74? I think 73 was the 74. pilot. 74. Was it 74? Well, yes. you know better than Something I do. Like that. Yeah, he was. Right? Around that time. Um, yeah. It, well, we did a pilot first. Yeah. But it looked doomed, actually, if I'm honest. You know, but, um, and again, I, I only did two series. It's amazing how many people remember me because I, I did two series and then I had so much work on and I, I left. Uh, I loved it, actually. I loved doing it in half I loved working with David Croft. I wish I'd had his temperament. He had an amazing temperament, but he was in control. You know, and he could, you do something in rehearsal and he'd laugh his head off. But you realise when he went out, he may have laughed at it, but it was not what he wanted. He didn't shoot it. Yeah. You know, and that was frustrating. So I thought you liked that. But um, also, I was going through a bad time in my own personal life at that time. So I think my, my view of everything was a bit skewed. I didn't think I was very good in it. I think my whole. So and I, if I see if I see it now, not that I see it very often, but I I do talk sometimes and show clips. And there's a clip I chose of it ain't off, uh, it ain't off, up, and it makes me laugh every time. And I think, well, well, it wasn't that bad. Not as bad as I thought I was. But I think I was, you know, as I say, it was a difficult time in my private life at that time. And yeah. um, uh, maybe had I not been, I might have stayed longer. Who knows? I don't think it was a bad thing to leave actually. No. Yeah. As a fellow writer, though, when you talk about um, Kerry and Croft. Do you think um, their sitcoms having a historical hook and their ability to write in that style was a, a draw to success? Oh, you know, they were brilliant. I got very friendly with David even after I left because I used to drop my daughter at school and I was writing on my own and I called him. And he, he, he lived in Albany Street and uh, I'd go and have a cup of coffee and sort of cry on his shoulder a bit. I remember Jimmy Perry and David Croft saying to me, you know what? I was quite a show-off writer. No, I liked complex plots. And I liked to fool the audience. Into that was the end. And then you get another coda. That was my style. But it was hard work to do it. Whereas, I remember Jimmy saying to me one day, he said, well, you put in one episode, we could make almost a series of three or four episodes out of what you're doing in one episode. And I think I overcomplicated my life by trying to be too clever sometimes. I mean, Don't Wait Up was very middle class. That's hard anyway. You know, I used to envy... John Sullivan and Fools and Horses, you know, because that was brilliant. I mean, he was the writer's writer, but you know, you knew with Rodney going, ah, oh, you plonker, or sorry, Delboy, oh, you plonker, or you got a huge laugh. You, you, with writing for middle class people as I did, you had to be witty. I don't know, I'm maybe grappling on a bit too much, but it was quite hard actually at that time. The stories were very complex and really took me. Ages to work out the story. The writing never took me that long because I always worked out a very detailed story and always knew where I was going with it, you know? Yeah. I think they would hold up very well today, don't wait up. Apart from the fashion, the stories themselves, I think we're very, it's all about divorce, really. It's also about the NHS, you know, the, a, G, a GP in the private sector. I don't know why the BBC don't repeat it because, as I say, apart from fashion, I think they would hold up incredibly, they're very timely still. Yeah. Um, it was actually the main thrust of it was about divorce you know if you remember the son got divorced after a couple of years and the, you know, our fiends got their separate ways and he couldn't cope with his father getting divorced after 28 years and that came from a, a feature on uh, I heard on to the Today programme saying more and more people were getting divorced after 25 years and I thought I mean that's blooming odd you know you've been together that long and that's how I formulated the ideas and then the professions came afterwards yeah so, in terms of writing, then, it's not just writing for screen. You're also an author. I am. Um, a massive selling author as well. Of, of, well of, of the, I'm not J.K. Rowling, put it no, that way. But I wrote, but, the, I, wrote, I wrote this book. Well, I wrote this book called The Fib. But they all started on radio. So I didn't write a book to begin with. I wrote, the first story I wrote was called The Gang Hut. It's in the book. It's in the fib and other stories. And one of the stories is called The Gang Hut. And I wrote it in my first term at drama school. And in the Christmas holidays, I went back up north to see my parents. And I, got a, I managed to get um, a part in a wonderful production called There is a Happy Land by Keith Waterhouse. Um, a radio production of his book. And I, a fabulous part. I think a rapist, I think. A big rainer. 
and a great cast in it by the way I mean there was um, David Jones who went not to be one of them he, he wouldn't be a jockey then he didn't want to be an actor and Robert Powell was in it and Ben Kingsley but he wasn't called Ben Kingsley then I can't remember his name now actually he was he was an Asian name um, Henry Livings became a great writer and um, I showed this story I'd written The Gang Up to um, Alfred Bradford the producer and he said oh change it to the first person and I did and that gave me a whole new style sold it to the BBC uh, as a morning story um, and um, well I was going to say I was on the train going up north and I met this girl I was at school with it wasn't it I mean the girls school and the boys school were separate but I knew her and um, she said she'd type it out for me because it all went by hand and what she did she I didn't know she again amazing luck she worked for the producer of a program called Morning Story, Hazel Luthway, she was called, and she showed it to her boss, and she said, well, I love this story, we'll do it. So I read it on Morning Story. So the first thing I ever wrote, I sold to the BBC. Then I used it as an audition piece for Woman's Hour as a reader, a few years later, and the producer said, oh, that's a nice story. I said, I wrote it. She said, well, write five more, four more, we'll do it as a, as a serial. So, so that was easy, I took a few months over it. So I wrote five more, so then I had five stories, four more. And then I, it was hugely successful, all written for adults, all very evocative of the 50s. So they commissioned another five, so I did it again. Then somebody heard it, somebody, they, I think Penguin produced one of uh, published one of them, and there was an educational version, and then the Collins published the first trade version, and that's how it started. And that's what, that's about 50 years ago, and it's still published today. Yeah. By Matt Miller. Uh, and then I, I followed it up about, about, ooh, a long time later with the second book, and then a long time later with the third book. So there are three. And the second and third, I think, are better stories. But but um, the first one is on the national curriculum and has been yeah. ever since the national curriculum started. So yeah. I've been very lucky. Yeah. Well, that helped me. Uh, by the way, it did help me when I went to Humphrey Barclay when I was in Doctor in the House, saying, look, I, I'd quite like to have a go at this writing lark. Because I had actually written the story, some of the stories. Yeah. Some of them have been published in anthologies. So, I, you know, I was an amateur writer, I was a writer. But also, I'd, I'd had a play done on BBC Two in 30-minute theatre called Home is Where You Hang Your Hat. So, it wasn't like, oh, I fancy, I had actually done some writing. And that's how I started. And then, did that, that work sort of help you when you were asked by Michael Mulberger to, to be a contributing author? <laughs> Oh, well, I was, by that time, I was, Michael Moore, I think I met him at some Collins do, or was it Matt Miller? I can't remember who it was then. Uh, I, did, I did knew Michael, and uh, he just he just said, oh, I'm, I'm doing a, an anthology of war stories. And I'd already started, ah, I remember what it was. I'd already started doing the third book called The Trick. The third book is called The Trick. And one of the stories was a sort of war story and I said well I will do this but it's going to be my own anthology as well but I was very flattered to be asked by Michael and of course he he does a nice little byline on one of my books saying I don't want to say now George Orwell's wonderful something like that <laughs> uh, but, but that was a long way into my writing when I did that I mean yeah. I don't know how many years ago but I'd actually done quite a lot by that time yeah. and it was just a sort of happy thing for him to approach me and say oh I love your stories would you write one for this Wolves. They were, yeah. What were they called? I think it was celebrate. I can't remember what it was now. But it was nice to be included. Yeah, it was lovely. Love it. So looking back over your career, what would you say your proudest achievement is? Whew. Well, I think my proudest achievement is managing to have a happy family life combined with what is a very stressful acting career. I mean, acting takes you away from home. Uh, I think that's one of the reasons I, I started writing is when my kids were little it gave me more control over my life so if any of them were poorly at least I was there when you've got commitments acting wise you're out in the provinces or even abroad it's a great stress for your wife so I think I was drawn to especially when they were little to do more writing from home so I'm proud of the fact that um, I've got four children I'm very very proud of and they're all doing well, uh, and I think balancing balancing your career with your family is not easy. And in some ways, actors have to be quite selfish in their choice of work. Mm. Sometimes I have been a little. I remember doing a play up in Yorkshire at the West Yorkshire Playhouse, and kids were older then. But uh, you know, I don't like being away from home very much. 
really, and I, you know, especially if you're happily married. But and I remember my wife saying, "Well, do you really want to do this play?" I said, "I do actually. It's a really interesting play. It was by Simon Armitage, and it was directed by John Tiffany, who has done very well since then." And so off I went, and I did, I did find myself up in Leeds and thinking, "What the hell am I doing here? Why am I here?" You know, you know, because who gives a care what you're doing in Leeds, really? But I did enjoy doing the play. So that's. But those days are a bit over now. I'm a bit more selfish, and I will only know if I had to go away from home. It would have to be something really special I'd have to do. Most of my work, if I, when I do work, is TV. I need mean, might be for a few, away for a few nights, not a long stretch. I wouldn't go on tour anymore. So that's cut a whole line of work out for me. Yeah. You know, I've been abroad. I was, in, I was in Australia doing a play for six months. I only just got married then. Uh, I was, you know, if I'm on tour, you know, you have to, to pay the bills. I think it's quite a stressful life, actually, and I think I don't miss that at all. So now I do like getting the odd telly, you know, a nice casualty or a whole bit, something like that. It's lovely. EastEnders, I loved EastEnders. Up the road, back in my own bed every night. It was lovely. Yeah. That's the kind of thing I want now, you see. So what, what's next for George Latham? <sighs> well, I don't do a lot now. Um, partly out of choice. <sighs> partly, I think I'm just a bit knackered by it. I mean, I, I do get, look, the juices go. Once I get something and I'm in it and I love company, I'm very gregarious. That was when it was hard being a writer because I'm a very gregarious person and it's hard writing and you're on your own all day and, oh, gosh. Um, I love it when a, a nice telly comes along, but I've also got grandchildren now and I'm, I'm on hand to help with that. I mean, uh, my daughter is a f- near five-year-old, but she's got these twins and they're very tiring, so I'm always on hand to run around a bit so in a way that I put that ahead of yeah work um, I do a bit yeah yes yeah. so it's my it's my way of saying I'm so opting out a bit but yeah. that's not to say if anybody hears this podcast and I hope many people do say oh George you'd be marvellous in this part of course I wouldn't be there and yeah. doing it um, but um, I'm a bit choosy that's what I'm trying to say yeah yeah that's great, thank you very much. Oh good, I hope it's a good interview for you. A big thank you to our guest for being the subject of another Beyond the Title interview. If you like this, why not browse the website and see if there's anything else that takes your fancy. Don't forget to like our Facebook page to receive updates of forthcoming interviews and to see more information about me and what I do. Thanks again and hopefully see you next time for another Beyond the Title interview.